Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Bellinger. I'm the Acting Dean of the School of Law at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and it is my task and I should say pleasure to welcome all of you today to the African Ombudsman Research Center webinar, which is entitled Showcasing Sectoral Ombudsman, um, with a specific focus on municipal, police, and military ombudsmen. Um, you've probably all joined the webinar because you know what it is about, so it would seem a little bit pointless to, to quickly run through that. Um, what we're going to look at today is the legal basis and the mandate of sectoral ombudsmen and their relationship to national ombudsmen. And so I'm not going to step on the toes of the people who know a lot more about that than I do. Um, what I'm going to do is just welcome you um, to the webinar um, and then hand it over to the experts. And um, speaking of experts, the people that we're going to have joining us today um, will be um, the Acting Public Protector of South Africa, um, Advocate Kweleka Kekela, um, who is also, and it's a far more important role, the acting chairperson of the ARC board. Um, it's been facilitated by the Honorable Vuzmusi Magwebu, who's the Ombudsman of the City of Cape Town, and we have three speakers, um, all of whom are designed to test my ability to pronounce names. So um, I'd like to welcome Ms. Helena Nachtegale, the Ombudsman for the City of Ghent in Belgium, Lieutenant General retired Vusmusi Masondo, who's the Ombudsman for the South African Military, so the South African Military Ombud, and Major General Oswald Reddy, who is the Western Cape Police Ombudsman. Um, I suspect that uh, many of you, well, hopefully not too many of you, because I'm beginning to feel a little bit old, um, for many of you, well, for some of you, like me, the concept of an ombudsman um, in South Africa or a public protector in South Africa was a bit of a foreign concept um, when I was in my youth and studying the law. Um, I say foreign not because uh, the notion of accountability is an anathema to South Africa or to Africa and society as a whole, but because it was an anathema to good governance, accountability and protection of the public in the area in which I grew up. And those values were being deliberately repressed. And so... Therefore, with the, with the advent of democracy in South Africa and the, the development of a public protector's office and the notion of ombudsman, it was a great cause for celebration. And so I think that the development of sectoral ombudsman is equally important because it takes that rejuvenation of accountability and protection one step further, brings it one step closer to the people and it's something which should be encouraged and developed. And it is very, very, very encouraging to see that this is what's happening and this is why this webinar is so very important because this, this digs down into exactly what that is about and how it is to develop and how it is happening. So I think that um, probably that's enough for me. I just wanted to say that um, I'm very pleased to see that this is what we're doing and how it is happening. And I, I think that this notion of, of continuing with the development of accountability, continuing with the protection of people who need it most means that we're on the right track and something that I'm very proud that um, the university and the law school is associated with. And I'm very proud to welcome you to the webinar. So thank you very much and enjoy. Over to you, APP. Good morning, a very good morning, um, colleagues. Um, I really wish to take this opportunity, uh, a prestigious opportunity for that matter, uh, to greet my fellow colleagues, um, UKZN, for your ever uh, very warm and welcoming all the time when we have these leadership, uh, Prof Bellingham the facilitator and ombudsman of the city of Cape Town, Mr. Vusumi Zimakwebu, military ombudsman of the Republic of South Africa, retired Lieutenant General Vusumu Ramagala Masondo, ombudsman of the city of Gent, Mrs. Helena Nechtegal, Western Cape Police Ombudsman, Major General Oswald D. Reddy, members of the African Ombudsman and Mediators Association, most importantly, the staff that has put this together. Ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. Once again, we are gathered under this virtual roof of the African Ombudsman Research Center, commonly known as AOC and the University of KZN to quench our thirst from each other's 
overflowing cups of knowledge and expertise. As in the previous occasion, this webinar is in fulfillment of one of the four strategic programs of AOC, capacity building. The others are, of course, research, information sharing, and advocacy. The focus this time around is sectoral ombudsman, as Prof. Bellinger has stated. To help steer the conversation, the AOC and UKZN have assembled a formidable team of experts from our ranks to be directed by Mr. Magwebe, who is for us at the Public Protector South Africa a familiar face in that he previously served as a senior investigator at one of our Eastern Cape offices in Ipisho and at head office in Pretoria. It is often said justice delayed is justice denied. In other words, what good is justice if it is going to be served further downstream when the prejudice party has already endured the effects of an unfairness? Heads of ombudsmen and mediator institutions worldwide concur that inadequate budgets, which result in, among other things, a disproportionate proportionate between human resources and the contents of case baskets ranks among the leading challenges facing our line of work. Needless to say, this state of affairs poses a threat to the credibility of the ombudsman or the mediator in the eyes of the public, in that the turnaround time for the resolution of complaints will be affected negatively, resulting in delayed and therefore denied justice due to the reality that in many countries governments often do not have enough in the kitty to go around it is unlikely that the budgetary rules of ombudsman and mediator institutions will go away anytime soon accordingly this calls for the alternative ways of guaranteeing that justice is done and that justice is done reasonably fast one of these options is for countries to establish and devolve the power to resolve complaints to, to credible internal complaints handling mechanisms or smaller sector specific ombudsman and mediator institutions. As a public protector South Africa, this is something we have been actively advocating for. We are the supreme complaints body in the country. We enjoy jurisdiction over more than 2000 organs of state and yet our resourcing is not commensurate with the workload. In the 2017-2018 financial year, our total caseload was 18,330, and the total number of investigators was just 130. This meant on average, each investigator had a, a caseload of 141 cases per annum. The following year, the total caseload was 14,194, and the total number of investigators just 151. Although the bolstering of our investigation team marked a drop in the total caseload per investigator per annum from 141 to 94 cases, the figure was still much higher compared to the global best practices, which averages between 10 and 25 cases per investigator. As a result, we began lobbying government to found internal complaints handling mechanisms. Virtually all the in-house complaints handling avenues in the public administration, including the military ombudsman in the city of Johannesburg ombudsman, were established pursuant our passionate pleas with the organ of state. In the case of the military ombudsman, not only did our appeals trigger in part the establishment of the institution, we also made inputs on the draft legislation in terms of which the institution was established and from which it derives its powers. These included the recommendation that the ombud should be appointed by the president, their rank be equivalent to that of a judge, their required qualifications in the name of the office, um, and that they should receive their budget financially. More than anything, it is also to ensure the independence of these institutions. In addition to the military ombudsman of the city of Johannesburg, we have Mr. Makwebu, the city of Cape Town ombudsman, the tax ombudsman, the Western Cape police ombudsman and a few university ombudsmen. Since the establishment of these institutions, the bulk of the complaints concerning military 
municipal tax police and student issues, which would have previously clogged our investigation and complaints resolution pipeline, now go to the respective ombudsman in their offices, thereby freeing our hands to focus on systemic and more complex investigations. However, we still see uh, within our role complaints then of the non-implementation of the reports of these se sectoral ombudsmen, which we need to continue to support to ensure that they result the perceived impactfulness within their respective sectors. The understanding is that the Public Protector South Africa is a complaints body of last resort, retaining residual jurisdiction. In other words, should the complainants who entrusted the complaints bodies of first instance not get joy, our door would still be open to assist them. We call upon you to encourage the establishment of such avenues in your countries. As you go about doing that, do stress the importance of, of observing the OR Campbell minimum standards of effective ombudsman institution and cooperation. As you will recall, this minimum standards, which are mirrored by the recently adopted Venice principles, include independence and autonomy, establish that is preferably guaranteed in the constitutions of the individual states and the security of tenure of heads of institutions. They also include the mandate, resources, operations, accessibility and conditions of service, impartiality and accountability of such institutions. Once established, cooperation between the national ombudsman and such institutions become paramount. In our case, we have entered into memoranda of understanding with some of them. Through these agreements, we formalize mutual aid for the optimal use of resources and management of potential duplications of work by way of a cross-referral of complaints, as well as collaborative public awareness initiatives. With those few words, I wish to welcome all of you colleagues to this session. Not only do I look forward to hearing what our esteemed panelists have in store for us, I also anticipate active participation from all of you. It is only when we share experiences and exchange ideas that we will be the cutting edge of complaints resolution and the delivery of swift justice to the people in our respective countries. I thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and a special thank you to you, Advocate Colega uh, Zalega, the Acting and Public Protector of South Africa. We appreciate those words, and they are indeed uh, encouraging us. They give us strength. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Good, good morning to everyone. Bonjour. My name is Vusumzi Magwebo, and I have a special privilege uh, this morning to really um, conduct these uh, proceedings. I want to thank the, our host, the UKZN, for entrusting me with this job. Mine really today is to really extend once again a special warm welcome to our speakers, uh, to all participants who have joined from every corner of the globe. Much appreciated. We value your time. Uh, just a few uh, pointers this morning. Uh, I, I hope and trust that everyone, every participant has received the order of the proceedings. Just a quick reminder uh, and a special plea to the speakers that we really uh, work with us and adhere to time. So every speaker will be given 15 minutes and then they will go to the next speaker, the same uh, amount of time and uh, to the last speaker, uh, 15 minutes as well. Thereafter, we will then go to the Q&A. Uh, so whilst the speakers are lining up, uh, the questions um, will, uh, you know, I would appreciate if uh, the, when questions come up, then they will be posted in the Q&A so that uh, when we get to the Q&A session, we can then uh, all engage. Um, lastly, I just want to say uh, to the participants again, you know, the idea really, this is not a lecture, this is a space for exchange of ideas. So you're welcome to post questions as we go along so that uh, the speakers can, uh, you know, assist us uh, in uh, responding to those uh, questions. Now, uh, our first speaker quickly is um, ready, uh, Ms. Mrs. Helen Nachtigale. Uh, Mrs. Helen Nachtigale um, 
was appointed as the second Ombudsman of the city of Ghent upon the retirement of Mrs. Rita Pasimiers. Mrs. Nachtigail is a 40-year-old Belgian national who has a master's degree in modern history. She has previously worked during nine years as an investigator for federal ombuds in Brussels, which gave her extensive experience in legal analysis and investigations of complaints in the context of Belgian federal administration. Often in close collaboration with other ombudsmen, during her career, she focused on the rights of refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced people, both in European context as, as the field in different African countries. Mrs. Helen Nachtdale has worked for Belgian Red Cross for the Commissioner for Refugees and Stateless Persons in Brussels, as well as for the UNHCR in several African countries in the Middle East, often in sensitive and politically tense environments. Next to this, she was also the short-term election observer for the European Commission in Tunisia in 2010 and Malawi in 2014. She lives in the city center of Ghent together with her husband. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow participants, let's welcome Mrs. Helen Nachtidale as our first speaker of the day. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Magwebo, and thank you everyone for um, the invitation. I'm always very pleased to meet even online with colleagues, and I'm always also very eager to meet with other local ombudsmen. Um, maybe I can share a bit of my experiences. Uh, I will try to see if I can share my screen because I'm not very technically, um, um, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, we can. Oh. Yes, yes, okay. Thank you. So um, I am uh, the Ombudsman of the city of Ghent and uh, Ghent is um, uh, relatively, we are a, a city of uh, 260,000 inhabitants, a historical city. And you can see, actually, you see the tower in the middle, it is the Belfry Tower, which was meant since the Middle Ages to guard the city's right and at the bottom, the feet of the tower is my office in the little historical building, which is quite symbolical to me because we are actually also meant to uh, be the guardian of the democratical rights in, in our society. So it's, it's very special. And you can also see we are in the middle of the city center. This is just a small introduction. Um, Belgium is a very small country. We are 11 million people. We are bordering the North Sea and at the north we have the Netherlands, at the south we have France and in the east we have Germany. We are also, um, because we have three language groups, we are a bit a complicated country. We are a federal country, so we have actually two federal ombudsmen, one for the Dutch speakers, one from the Francophone, and both uh, also know, uh, speak the German language. And then we have four different regions. We have Flanders in the north, the yellow part, which has their own ombudsman. Then the, the red part is the Francophone uh, community, has also their own ombudsman. The blue part is the German speaking uh, small community. They also have their own Ombudsman, and then the little uh, circle in the center is uh, Brussels, is the capital area, which has also a newly appointed Ombudsman. Maybe some of you will know Catherine de Breuker, who used to be federal Ombudsman previously. Uh, and in Belgium, we only have 10 communities who opted for their own local Ombudsman. So we're only 10 local Ombudsman. Six of the 10 work on their own without any uh, staff in their office. So, um, and you can see a picture of a few years ago of one of the meetings of the local ombudsman. Uh, I just want to explain um, regional versus local ombudsman because we have this particularity in also the Netherlands, this is the same. The national ombudsman in the Netherlands can also act as a local ombudsman 
for cities who don't have their own on, own local ombudsman. In Belgium, it's more or less the same. It's not totally the same, but this is the advantage for uh, for uh, civilians who who live in a city who didn't choose to have their own local man. At least they can turn to the ombudsman of their language community. It's not the same as a local ombudsman, but at least they have this. And I realize it's very precious that in my city, 25 years ago, they opted to uh, install an ombudsman. Um, so there is no, what I forgot to say, because this was one of the uh, points also for the, for the webinar, there is no hierarchy amongst public ombudsmen in Belgium. Uh, because we own uh, all the different levels, federal, regional, local, we all have different competences. And that's why we, uh, we have no hierarchy. Then I want to explain you a little bit uh, on the city of Ghent. You can see here we, have, we are a middle age, uh, uh, a city dating from the middle ages. In the middle ages, Ghent was the biggest city north of Paris, just to give an indication. We have a port, we are, uh, we always have been uh, tradespeople, so uh, we, we have a port, we have almost 265,000 people, we have a university, we have a lot of students, and we also have a lot of tourists, and if you want to come our, uh, our site, I will warmly welcome you uh, in our city. This is uh, my team, and um, sorry, it was a bit uh, quickly. Uh, I have, um, we are five uh, full-time equivalents, uh, me included, in staff. Uh, the institution started in 97. Uh, it was the city council who decided to uh, have an ombudsman. Antwerp actually was the first city in Belgium to have uh, a local ombudsman. I am appointed by the city council, but the selection happened by an independent HR uh, office. My, I have a mandate of six years, so I am, it has been five years now since I took office. It's renewable. I am independent in line with the Venice principles. Yearly, I, report, I present my report in the city council, which is equivalent to, like, for example, the federal ombudsman will present his report in, uh, before a federal parliament. I can do recommendations, however, they are not binding. And of course, I have unrestricted access to all relevant information in, uh, if I want to investigate a complaint. And I can uh, invest, start an investigation by own initiative, but I have to motivate it to the city council if I want to do this. And then uh, what is actually our competence? You can actually see on the picture also the, the giant ear. Uh, we did it in the spring of this year to celebrate uh, the 25th anniversary of our institution which is important because still many people don't know we exist. And if we don't, if they, people don't know we exist, they will never turn to us. We are uh, competent to investigate complaints about the city administration, but also local police and social housing companies. We investigate complaints and try to mediate actually to make it sure, I try to go for a win-win solution because in the long run, this is the, most uh, efficient. And of course, we receive many complaints about polit political decision, but I cannot, I cannot judge political decisions. I can only judge the working of the uh, city administration. And we are uh, um, listening ear for residents also, because we, since we are so close to everyone and our door is always open, people uh, often come just to talk or, or to, to talk about their frustrations. And I think this is one of the, the tasks we have as local ombudsman. Um, maybe I'm going too fast, but uh, the top five complaints, and I want to add to this, a few years ago, I received a visit of the local ombudsman of Seoul, which is a huge city with much more uh, inhabitants than Belgium even. But they had the same 
top five complaints as we have in uh, Ghent with 260,000 people. And the first one is of obviously linked with um, the historical city center we have. Uh, we have a small city center and there are so many cars, more and more people have two or more cars and they all want to have a parking spot in front of their house, which is impossible. The environment, we have a low emission zone. So in the historical city center, the car access for cars is limited and also based on the emission of a car. And it, it creates a lot of uh, tension also. And uh, of course, I think everyone will recognize this. The collection of household waste is everywhere. Even in Seoul was a big problem and litter I think everyone can relate to, to this type of uh, complaints. Social housing is a big problem because we have a lack of sufficient uh, social housing. Uh, some people have to wait for 10 years or longer before they can actually have access to uh, social housing. And then uh, the last, uh, of the top five of complaints is uh, about social um, welfare and social benefits. Um, and especially in um, COVID times, this type of complaints increased because many people lost their income and uh, have, had to ask for um, social benefits. And this, cre this actually creates uh, no, their own type of uh, complaints and problems. And then I want to stress also the advantage of being a local ombudsman compared to, I worked for the federal ombudsman, so I can easily compare or a regional ombudsman who is acting as local ombudsman. We are in the middle of everything. We are very close to people. People can easily reach us by public transport. Um, and also we are, we are open without appointment. I find this very important and especially, especially in uh, the age where everything becomes digital. And I'm grateful for this webinar that we can meet each other online uh, without any logistical, um, sorry, I, um, uh, but um, I think these days, there is too much uh, uh, importance for the digital way. And especially elderly people don't easily have access to, to um, uh, digital means and are very grateful that they can actually come physically to our office. And uh, so I, I am, for me, it's very important that people don't have to make an appointment on a computer or take a phone, that they can just, can just walk in. Um, I, I continue to stress this also in the city uh, centers. What is also important is that we also hold office, I mean, we open our doors every month for the federal ombudsman and the ombudsman for pensions, and they hold a consultation once a month in our office, which also makes it easier, especially for a pension ombudsman, uh, for, for uh, people who are older, and want to discuss their complaint, they can they don't have to make to to take the train and go to Brussels to speak with the ombudsman in person. And then what is also a big advantage is we physically investigate, we take the bicycle, we go to the people to to, to check uh, the subject of their complaint on the spot and it leads to quicker results and it's also the personal contact with people is essential, I find, as a local ombudsman, is a great advantage. And then I want to also explain a bit more about other ombudsmen in Belgium. We, also, we often receive complaints who are actually meant for another ombudsman, for a colleague, and then we transfer the complaint for the civilian uh, who is coming to us. Uh, a complaint can be partly lo of local competence and partly federal. I, I give an example, immigration uh, uh, applications, for example, often have a local aspect and a federal ombuds, uh, aspect, so we, we work together. We often have uh, meetings with other local ombudsmen because, as I said, six of the ten 
work without staff. So they, we, we often exchange actually um, uh, experiences amongst ourselves. And then, uh, yes, as I already said, the Ombudsman for Pensions and Federal Ombudsman come to hold uh, free consultations in our office. And twice a year, all Belgian ombudsmen, public and private, uh, gather together also to exchange experiences, which is very fruitful, actually. That was my presentation. I think I didn't uh, exceed the time limit. So I'm open for questions from your side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Nachenkela. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you for the presentation. That was very insightful. I really enjoyed it. And I must say, you're doing great with time because <laughs> uh, you've just, uh, you are still having two minutes on your side. On the, issue of, on, on the issue of questions, I must say we will come to the questions at the end um, of um, the proceedings when every speaker has uh, been afforded the opportunity to deliver his or her own presentation. But I must just say and reflect on what uh, you have presented to us. And uh, I just couldn't agree with you more when you raised the issue that the local ombudsman is uh, an institution that is closer uh, to the people. Really, uh, I couldn't agree with more. So it calls then to reason that uh, the local ombudsman by its own nature must be fully functional, must be alert, because uh, all the issues that are brought to, to, to the people, and as I look at the nature of your complaints, these are the issues that uh, are really uh, what we call bread and butter issues from uh, where I am sitting where you deal with social grant issues. Social welfare issues are issues of people who really um, by their own nature are vulnerable communities and uh, they need to be assisted. And the uh, social grant really throws a lifeline to, to those uh, folks who are struggling in our midst. And social housing as well as the nature of the complaints you have highlighted. Uh, that again, you know, reminds us of the importance of the local ombuds. It may have a limited jurisdiction, as you have highlighted that you don't have jurisdiction on other matters. That's fine. It, it, it's, it's the same, I guess, uh, for many of us as a local ombuds, where we are not having jurisdiction to investigate complaints leveled against um, you know, uh, uh, city council decisions. And uh, for all good intents and purposes, uh, that issue uh, is an issue that cuts across, I suppose. But uh, I must uh, also, you know, uh, reflect quickly again on, as I sum up your presentation, the powers and the functions uh, of the local ombudsman. I think they are very important. You've highlighted also the investigation methodology, and I, I'm really, I'm really uh, happy that you have uh, indicated to us that uh, part of your methodology is to go on, on inspection in local and quickly go to the scene and see for yourselves. It's very important to see for yourselves lest you may be misled. And it also expedites the resolution of the complaint because by our own nature, speed is important because when people come to us, they are really on their knees. The system has failed them. They are battered and bruised. So I'm happy that um, you, 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 are, you are encapsulating that spirit in the discharge of, of, of your duties. As I said again, you know, access to our services. It's one thing to have a mandate, the powers and the functions, but it's another thing that uh, those services that you're offering, those powers that are, you are entrusted with, the residents within your jurisdiction have access to those services as the local ombuds. So when we've indicated that uh, you, you, are, you are open to walk-ins, uh, access uh, via technology that complaints could be sent to your offices, and uh, to me, that's uh, really at the heart of our services. Our services are not only freely available, but our services must be available to all within our jurisdiction. Even those who may not have access to technology must be able to walk in into our offices. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, Mrs. Nachtekela, um, we really appreciate that. And uh, your presentation was awesome. We're just gonna move, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues to, to, to the next speaker. We've just now had the presentation 
from the local ombuds of, of, of the city of Ghent. Now we're going to the next speaker. Our next speaker is the retired Lieutenant General Vusumuzi Ramagala Masondo. Mr. Masondo is the second military ombudsman of the Republic of South Africa. He was appointed by the President of the Republic on the 1st of November, 2019, to hold office for a non-renewable period of seven years. He's a professional soldier with a career spending period of 43 years. Can you believe it? He joined the controversies where the Liberation Army of the African National Congress in 1976 and served in its ranks in various capacities until he was integrated into the South African National Defense Force in 1994 with the rank of major. He participated in the negotiations of the establishment of the South African National Defense Force under the auspices of the Joint Military Coordinating Committee, where he was co-chairperson of, of the inspection web group. Retired Lieutenant General Masondo retired in 2019 as the Chief of Staff of Sander, having also served as the Chief of South African Army from 2011 to 2016. In 2009, while he was serving in the South African Army as Chief Army Force Preparation in charge of all training in the Army, he was appointed as Director Exercise uh, Golfio uh, SADC, that is a dead peacekeeping exercise intended to confirm the operational readiness of the SADC standby force. He completed all the required military courses up to the Executive National Security Program. Retired Major General Busumuzi Ramakala Masondo holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of South Africa, a certificate in defense management from the University of Redwaterfront, a certificate in labor relations from Pretoria University, a diploma in computer studies from Species College, Harare, Zimbabwe, and a diploma in secretarial studies from Tabora Secretarial College in Tanzania. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to welcome our distinguished speaker, uh, Lieutenant General Musumuzi Ramakala Masondo to present um, his uh, mandate and uh, to present to us uh, and help us understand the good work he's doing. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, program facilitator and colleagues, uh, please allow me uh, to say, in the interest of time, all protocol observed. <clears throat> I'm very pleased uh, to address uh, this webinar on the establishment of the sectoral ombudsman and to share my experience and insights on the model of the only military ombud office on the African continent. As a point of uh, departure, the office is uh, established uh, in terms of uh, the military ombud act number four of uh, 2012, and was intended to be a mechanism independent of uh, the military command structure, exercising oversight over the defense sector, and assisting it with adhering to principles and practices of good governance. The objective of uh, the office is to investigate and ensure that complaints are resolved in a fair, economical, and expeditious uh, manner. For the sake of time, I will only speak to the selected sections of uh, the Military Ombud Act. Uh, to give you an understanding of how we operate as an organization. Driven by the uh, uniqueness of uh, the defense uh, sector environment, it was appreciated uh, that the military ombud could play a major role in the governance of uh, the armed forces and strengthen public confidence in the reputation of the armed forces without, of course, undermining the military chain of command. 
The military rumble therefore investigates the complaints about the manner in which uh, conditions of service of a, of a member or former member has been administered. Complaints about the official conduct of members of the defense force from members of the public are also investigated. Upon completion of an investigation and where a complaint is upheld, the Ombud has a legislative obligation to make recommendations to the minister on a suitable redress. The office does not make policy or take uh, decisions uh, based on operational issues within the defense force. From this, it can be seen that uh, the bigger role of the office is to enhance the efficiency and effective effectiveness of the defense force by reversing grievances and encouraging proper conduct of all soldiers. <clears throat> The role of the military ombud is to advance the nature of the employment relationship between members of the SADF and their employer. It must be acknowledged that the military has internal complaints procedures which must be exhausted before complaints are lodged with the office. Although in terms of uh, legislation, I do have the discretion to accept complaints where internal complaints uh, procedures have not been followed. This usually occurs where there is what the app calls, I call, I quote, inherent deficiencies in the system, close quote. However, it also gives my office an opportunity to identify systemic problems in the military and address them appropriately. The Act does provide for limitations on the jurisdiction of the office. And this includes uh, not investigating matters that are before a civilian or military court, or that have been decided by saying, including not interfering with the chain of command. I will now turn uh, to focus on the critical characteristics required for my office to function effectively and ensure it fulfills its objectives as provided for in the Act. And in doing so, I will also refer to identify gaps in the military almost Act. Firstly, I would like to discuss the issue of the independence of the office. The independence of my office is significant for the very purpose for which uh, this office was created. The Act does provide that my staff and I myself and function independently and impartially without fear, favor, or prejudice. And that the minister must afford to the Ombud such assistance as may be reasonably, reasonably required for the protection of uh, the independence impartiality and dignity of the office. The act uh, goes further to provide that no person may hinder or obstruct the ombud or members of his or her staff in performance of his or her or their functions. And members and employees of the department must cooperate with the ombud and the deputy ombud in the performance of their functions which includes uh, providing them reasonable access to facilities, information, and documents. The independence of the office is therefore guaranteed by law. These provisions uh, provide for no interference from the executive or the department. In uh, strengthening uh, the institutional independence of this office, the Act provides for the military ombud and the deputy military ombud to be appointed by the president. And there are clear procedures provided for their removal from office, including criteria that establish the circumstances under which this can be done. The military ombud and deputy ombud are both appointed for a non-renewable term of seven years 
And this is crucial in ensuring the security of their position. And of course, in preventing a conflict of interest that may arise with an extended or permanent tenure in the office. I'd like now to touch on the issue of uh, operational independence. <clears throat> While the Ombuds is provided with the legal authority to investigate complaints upon receipt of sale, the Act also provides he or she may appoint sufficient and qualified staff to assist him with his mandate and is obliged to determine the terms and conditions of service for his staff. It is noted that the guarantee of independence for most ombuds institutions is the capacity to investigate the complaints on own initiative. Uh, this previous speaker has also alluded to this. My office does not have these powers. <clears throat> this can be seen as an important characteristic of uh, independence because if uh, the office is able to conduct all the investigation, our investigation will not always be limited to the receipt of a complaint. The office is, however, able to conduct what is often called the uh, section six, subsection 11 investigation. The act provides that section six, subsection 11 for the minister to assign to the ombuds any other additional function which is not inconsistent with the act. We attempt to use this provision to investigate matters that have come to the attention of the office through the media and other means. These investigations are conducted without any interference from the Minister of Defense and Military Veterans. And in this way, the office is able to be proactive until the uh, legislation is uh, amended. Coming to the issue of uh, reporting, the Act provides for the military ombud to make recommendations to the Minister for implementation. The recommendation route is a sharp contrast to the directive route that was uh, taken in the military ombuds bill. The minister usually indicates whether she accepts or rejects uh, the recommendation. And if accepted, the chief of the National Defense Force is instructed by her to implement same. The act, however, does not make provision for instances where the minister does not respond to recommendations, neither for time frames uh, for the receipt of uh, the response. It is interesting to note that the act does provide that to any person be aggrieved by the decision of the military ombud, he or she can take such decision to the high court on review. Complainants who are not satisfied to review my decisions and the Department of Defense, although not uh, IPM, has also taken a couple of my decisions on review where the minister has accepted and sometimes where she has not accepted my recommendations. This may have uh, consequences uh, for the independence and the credibility of my office. However, I will not go into details of this issue, as some of these matters are still pending before court. The act further provides that the military ombud is required to report to the minister annually through an annual activity report and she will take, table the, the report before parliament. The question that has uh, arisen is why the military ombud reports to the minister when he or she is appointed by the president. In most military ombud institutions of other countries, such reporting is done directly to parliament. Further, in view of the civilian oversight provided by the office, it may be deemed appropriate that the office 
report to an authority that is outside of the defense sector. This will ensure that the recommendations of the military ombuds will be complied with and it further creates a sense of uh, credibility in the institution. Coming to the issue of uh, budgetary uh, independence, the budget uh, for the office is appropriated by Parliament as part of uh, the budget vote of the department and is really fenced. Excuse All me. Excuse me, General, I don't mean to be rude, uh, just to interrupt you. Can you speak closer to the mic? Uh, I, I get a sense that uh, you may not be audible enough to other participants. And uh, okay, just for time timekeeping, I would appreciate uh, if you could uh, take cognizance that you've got uh, three minutes left to wrap up. Thank you, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Let me then uh, proceed. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yes, yes, General, that sounds much better. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, then. The budget for the office is appropriated by Parliament as part of the budget vote of the department and is reinforced. The Ombud is required to keep the required accounting records and to report on the administration of his budget in accordance with the Public Finance Management Act. The military ombud, though, is not uh, the accounting officer and reports on finances through the Secretary for Defense. This office does not have its own enterprise uh, resource system and is entirely dependent on the Department of Defense for all support uh, systems such as uh, payroll, finance, uh, uh, and inf information technology. This process, this poses a host of uh, challenges for my office. And to this end, a ministerial directive was uh, drafted in order to ease these challenges. And is currently in the process of being implemented. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to mention that my office in the, is in the process of reviewing this uh, legislation in order to address challenges it faces and enhance its efficiency and effectiveness. Having said that, I would like to conclude by highlighting some of the steps we have taken, projects we have embarked on, and measures we have put in place to strengthen the independence and mode of operation of the office, which are the following. Networking with uh, stakeholders such as IOM, IOP, IOI, DTEP, etc., ensure benchmarking of group practices and fruitful innovation in the office. Cooperating with uh, the Defense Force on uh, issues of mutual interest. Memoranda of understanding have been signed with various organizations for mutual cooperation and benefit where jurisdiction may overlap. Oversight meetings with the Parliamentary Co uh, Portfolio Committee to discuss challenges and report on performance of the office. Outreach uh, programs uh, together with the annual military symposium ensure that the office reach out to its stakeholders and create an awareness about its existence and mandate. The office introduced a robust quality assurance policy to objectively assess the quality of investigations and reports. As part of this po policy, reports are then internally reviewed by the legal services directory to minimize uh, legal risks. In the 2019-2020 financial year, the office partnered with the Stellenbosch University to conduct the stakeholder perception survey. The aim was to learn and better manage the perception of our stakeholders about the office. The office in the 21-22 financial year conducted an internal complaint satisfaction survey. The aim was to understand operational customer satisfaction levels, and this helped the office to address issues such as responsiveness, customer satisfaction, and other identified service level gaps. These are some of the significant areas in our work which have had tremendous impact on the manner in which we execute our business. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for your time. Unmute yourself, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my bad there. Uh, thank you very much to the Lieutenant General Masondo for the presentation, much appreciated. Um, let me uh, you know, as I reflect again on the presentation, um, it appears and it looks like a thread, uh, I think inherently so in the, um, insti in the Ombuds Institute, that uh, we are creatures of statute because um, Lieutenant General Masondo indicated that um, they derive their powers from the Military Ombuds Act. And um, again, he emphasized the importance of the independence and the impartiality of his office. And again, what came out from the presentation is the powers and the functions that they investigate complaints, conditions of service amongst the members and ex-members or retired members, as well as uh, complaints from the public. I think that's very important because sometimes the public uh, may not know these things, that they're entitled to raise concerns uh, and any complaint against the public. I think that came out and uh, thank you for that. Again, the, the nature of complaints are not only complaints that uh, they come, uh, but uh, I'm sure as they investigate, they pick up the trends and those trends, they inform them to conduct what we call in our space, the um, systemic uh, problems or systemic investigations. It is important uh, to note that and uh, thank you for, 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 for bringing that to the fore again. And uh, it looks like um, we are wired up uh, really um, uh, similarly as uh, the Ombuds Institute. The investigation methodology, you've highlighted it and uh, the non-renewable term, and you've indicated the importance thereof. And uh, I think that is uh, important as well. And uh, again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we often say, in this work, we speak through our reports. It was uh, good to note that um, after investigation, they report and uh, they make uh, recommendations and recommendations by way of um, corrective measures or in some institutions, uh, their the legislation or the governance uh, uh, legal framework will say remedial action, like in the case of the public project of South Africa. And also again, um, it's important that um, the challenges were highlighted and uh, we have been taken uh, through what uh, needs to be done, the review of legislation. And thank you once again, um, Lieutenant General uh, Masondo, who has since retired and who's currently the reigning uh, military ombuds. Now, uh, before I move to the next speaker, I don't see the questions and uh, I am worried if there are questions, uh, please uh, indicate. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A session. I would want to see more sessions because really this is a, a moment to exchange ideas and also to engage uh, as we go to the last but not the least uh, speaker of today and the expert of today, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the speaker, uh, our third speaker. Our third speaker is uh, Major General Oswald Reddy. He is a certified leadership and a life coach, a trainer and a teacher with the John Maxwell team. He is a police veteran having served within the police in South Africa for over 39 years and held the rank of Major General for 19 years prior to his early retirement at the end of September 2021. He acquired widespread knowledge, skill, experience and expertise in various facets of policing and served as a commissioned officer within the management and leadership echelons of the police for over 30 years. During his 39-year career, he served in KwaZulu-Natal for two years, in the Western Cape for seven years, in Gauteng for 24 years, and again in the Western Cape for six years. Major General Oswald Reddy has served as the station commander of Hilbro and at various police stations. He also served as the area commissioner of Johannesburg and the cluster commander of Hanigiu. In April 2015, he was laterally transferred to George as the Eden Cluster Commander. He has a postgraduate degree and QF9 level qualification, master's in public administration degree from Harvard University in the United States. 
He also holds a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of South Africa, National Diploma in Police Administration from the Technicon of uh, RSA, a Diploma in Business Management from Business Management Training College of Southern Africa, and a certification from the John Maxwell Online University after attending the graduation in Orlando, Florida in the US in 2014. He also has additional life coaching certificates courses. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure we are excited. We have formidable speakers uh, today. And uh, let's welcome Major General Oswald Diredi. Major General, over to you, sir. The platform is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, program chair and organizers. I unfortunately had some technical challenges with my laptop, so I'm currently using my phone to, to do this uh, presentation. I've requested Frankie to try and flight a copy of my presentation as I go through it. Thank you for that, uh, Frankie. Uh, I'm going to try and do a higher level uh, overview just to ensure that I'm within the, the time frames. But greetings to the Crow presenters and all the attendees today. It's really an honor for me to uh, do this presentation. If I look at, uh, you know, the office where I am, the Western Cape Police Ombudsman, it's a five-year contract, a non-renewable contract. And I was appointed by the Premier of the Western Cape uh, in conjunction with the Portfolio Committee on Community Safety in the Western Cape Government and uh, sworn in by the Judge President of the Western uh, Cape High Court. The Western Cape Police Ombudsman is the only police ombudsman in South Africa uh, at this stage, you know, so we are sort of leading in this uh, field. It was established after the Kailicha Commission of Inquiry into poor service delivery and a breakdown in relations between the community and police. And it was officially started in December of 2019, uh, sorry, 2014. Our constitutional powers, I think let me go to the presentation to the vision firstly before we get to the powers. You can click there. Our vision is a society where there is mutual respect and trust between the people and the police. And our mission is to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of policing and to improve relations between the communities and the SAPS by conducting impartial and independent investigations of complaints in relation to police inefficiency and or a breakdown of relations between the police and the communities, thus enhancing trust and public confidence in the police. So that's uh, our overall mandate or our vision and, and mission. Our values, can go to the next slide. Okay, our values relate to integrity, trust, accountability. And then if I can go to the motto, our motto is, uh, you know, together we can ensure professional policing in the Western Cape. As I said, we only have uh, the police ombudsman in the Western Cape. So in terms of our powers, I think we can go to the next slide. We have a, a concurrent uh, constitutional mandate, which is derived directly from uh, the national constitution. And you go to the next slide. Okay. Yeah, no, no, uh, the constitutional powers. Thank you, yeah, if you can remain there. So in terms of section uh, 206 of the national constitution, the province or each province is allowed to monitor police conduct, oversee the effectiveness, and efficiency of the police service and to promote good relations between the police and community and also to assess the effectiveness of visible policing. As uh, subsection five, 
enables subsection 3 for the province to investigate or appoint a commission of inquiry into any complaint of police inefficiency or a breakdown in relations between the police and any community. So the Western Cape uh, Constitution Act 1 of 1998, section 66, 1 and 2, then provide uh, powers to us where we can investigate and appoint a commission of inquiry, once again, into the policing inefficiencies. If we can go to the next slide. We are situated in the CBD of uh, Cape Town and it's the first office of its kind, transparency, responsiveness, and accountability are some of our core values. Uh, we seek to investigate service delivery inefficiencies against the South African police service within the Western Cape. In fact, our powers also extend to the uh, Metro Police Department. In terms of our legislative mandate, uh, we derive our powers from the Western Cape Community Safety Act, um, it's Act 3 of 2013. It talks from Section 10 about the establishment of our office, appointment of the Ombudsman, independence of our office, functions and duties, uh, the procedures to submit complaints, the investigations that we do, investigating powers, and the offense and penalties are actually related to uh, non-compliance or failure to cooperate with our investigations. The Western Cape Provincial uh, Police Ombudsman regulations were enacted in 2015 and it was amended in 2020. Okay, we can go to, to the next slide. I think uh, in terms of our impartiality, as you can see the uh, Ombudsman and the staff they to you know, serve independently and impartially, perform our functions in good faith and without fear, favor, bias, or prejudice, subject to the constitution and, and the law, and preserve confidentiality in respect of information acquired in terms of, of the act. Our functions, the Ombudsman must receive and may investigate complaints submitted in terms of Section 16 regarding inefficiency of the police or a breakdown in relations between the police and community. Okay, can continue. So who can complain to us? Any person or any person on behalf of another person can complain, a member of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament any department or organized civil society organization can complain uh, collectively. There's a due process that they must follow where they submit a complaint in the prescribed form and, and manner. Okay, next slide. The investigations that we, we focus on, if we find that uh, a complaint is frivolous or vexatious, we, we then are able to turn down that complaint and uh, inform the complainant accordingly. But any other complaints, as we go through them, we would then appoint investigators and we would conduct uh, investigations. If we find that the complaint does not fall within our mandate, we would then refer that complaint to uh, another competent authority, for example, the independent police investigative directorate. Sometimes the SAPS deal with internal uh, complaint as well, or the Metro Police and the Human Rights Commissions, etc. Okay. Next slide. The section 17, the dealt with, yeah, I can go on. Uh, let's go to the type of complaints in the interest of time. There are four main categories that we focus on. Firstly, it's poor investigation. And in that category, usually complaints relating to failure to obtain statements, poor crime scene management, 
failure to arrest suspects or failure to use investigation aids or experts like calling out fingerprint experts, etc. The second category relates to poor communication, supplying incorrect information, lack of telephone etiquette at police stations, failure to provide feedback, and sometimes there are language barriers. We have uh, 11 official languages in South Africa, and there's going to be a 12th uh, official language, which is um, the uh, deaf and dumb uh, sign language, which will be enacted shortly. So poor communication is, is a challenge. And then the third category relates to poor response, where failure to answer the telephone or failure to attend to a complaint, lack of police visibility, poor response time or unnecessary delays in attending to victims of crime or to complaints. And the last category is unacceptable behavior, a manner of effecting an arrest, threatening or intimidating a member of the public whilst on duty, so those are the main categories that, that we deal with. In fact, since the inception of the office, we have dealt with almost 4,000 complaints uh, until the end of July, 2022. The Western Cape has a population of 7.2 million with a 151 police stations our staff currently is uh, 10 employees, including myself. Uh, we have three interns over and above that, and uh, there are three positions that we will fill in shortly. The, our offices are in the CBD and uh, we have uh, walk-ins. Uh, they don't have to make an appointment to come in and lodge their complaints. Our office hours are between seven in the morning and 1600 during the week. And uh, we have uh, online capability, telephone and uh, web applications where complaints can be lodged. We also uh, prepare and provide an annual report to the MEC, a member of the Executive Council in the Western Cape uh, Government, Department of Police Oversight and Community Safety, which is then presented to the Portfolio Committee on Community Safety. So some of the, the challenges that we, we have, similar to our, our colleagues who presented before me, we do not have any cohesive or enforcement powers. Uh, we make recommendations only on our investigations. We do not have any self-initiated investigation powers. So for example, if we see a problem in the media or so, we cannot initiate an investigation. We have to wait for a complainant to formally lodge the complaint with our office before we can start investigating the matter. We also do not have any mandate over the law enforcement offices, which currently operate from a local government or municipal level. We, we also do not have any post-monitoring powers on our recommendations. However, with the amended regulations, we now submit quarterly reports on our substantiated investigations to the Western Cape Portfolio Committee on Community Safety, and they hold the provincial commissioner accountable, and the provincial commissioner and his management then provide feedback to this uh, committee on the steps that they have taken in order to address some of these uh, identified uh, challenges. So we can go through on, on the slides. Uh, okay, can continue. Oral complaints are received. We I have someone manning the telephone and then we would take down the complaint. It is compulsory that the complainants uh, submit the identity documentation for our verification processes. Uh, that's with the exception of the uh, provincial parliament uh, members. Okay, you can go on. 
I've covered that. We also take compliments from uh, the miners, but uh, usually they are they are assisted, and we have a capability to to support them. Okay, you can go on. Can go on. I want to try and just manage the the time. That's a, a complaints how it's submitted, our um, website, etc. Okay. Different types uh, of information that we require. You can go to the next slide. Receive the complaints are uh, once they are lodged, they are screened, and then we have a screening committee. Once the screening committee looks at the complaints, they would then uh, either allocate it to an investigator if it belongs to us. Uh, if not, we then refer it to the appropriate authority. Next slide. Then the manner in which we dispose of it, if it's founded, we would then indicate to the relevant authorities and we'd give them recommendations on how to resolve it. Is there are complaints which are unfounded and unsubstantiated. We then inform the relevant authorities accordingly and we would provide the necessary guidelines on how to, to address it. The offenses and penalties. Major General, uh, yes. please wrap up. Thank you. Okay, the offenses and penalties. It's an offense for any person uh, who, without just cause, refuses or fails to comply with any direction or request by the Ombudsman, or refers, uh, refuses to answer any questions put to him or her, and or gives answers to their knowledge which is false, or if they in there obstruct the Ombudsman in our investigations, then uh, the penalty is guilty of an offense and liable on conviction to a fine or an imprisonment not exceeding three years or to both. So that brings us to, to the end of, of the presentation. And uh, I think let me go wrap up and, and leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Major General Reddy. Once again, it was insightful. And uh, the takeaway for, for me, and I hope for everyone, is again noting that uh, you are also a creature of statute from the constitution to the provincial constitution, Western Cape Community Safety Act and the regulations. So you seem to be anchored very well and it cuts across all the local ombuds where we derived our powers that are clearly spelled. I also noted your, your limitations like, <laughs> and in, in fact, when you said that uh, you, you cannot do or conduct own initiative investigations. This is exactly what I'm battling with in the city of Cape Town. We have the city by law that has limited our powers, but we are in the process of um, uh, going back to council and ask to be given more powers to conduct own initiative investigations for all good intents and purposes, just like uh, the public protector and many other institutions are doing so. And I wish you well in that space because when I look at the number of complaints you, you have um, received thus far, 4,000, uh, that clearly demonstrates that there is a need for this office. Uh, policing is a challenge in South Africa. We know the limitation of resources, cases move slowly, and uh, the lack of uh, you know, communication, it came out from your, your, your presentation, how the police and uh, the residents in the jurisdiction of the Western Cape uh, you know, maybe struggling to get feedback from the cases they reported or investigations not moving uh, with the necessary speed and just being updated of what is being done. So that again indicated um, yeah, that uh, there is a need uh, for this office and uh, those who have uh, who had foresight, it's been a blessing and uh, continue uh, the good work and we appreciate that. And again, in your presentation, it came out clearly the issue of the penalty clause. I think the penalty clause is important because it assists the, the institution 
in instances where there's lack of cooperation or where the institution is undermined or insulted to protect the integrity of this work and to protect you know the mandate you've been given and i think um, in all the um, legislations that empowering us as ombudsman the offenses and penalty clauses is important sometimes we take it for granted but it is important to protect our work and they give us the tools where we are hindered so that we can do this work unhindered the impartiality uh, and uh, the independence of your work is very important uh, i sum it up as holding uh, the South African police services uh, accountable for their actions, inactions, decisions, lack thereof. So thank you very much for that uh, insightful presentation once more again. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this hour, we have uh, reached a milestone. We're getting to the Q&A session. We have seen that the questions uh, have arrived and uh, the panelists or the experts in our panel uh, must be ready uh, to interact with the questions. We have 20 minutes to the uh, panelists and uh, that 20 minutes we will uh, use it um, very wisely and make sure that nothing is left behind. Uh, if we happen because of time, we are limited by time. If 20 minutes is exhausted to the questions, I'm sure Frankie and his team, as they always do, they will uh, share the responses. Uh, to those questions directly to those who have posed those questions but whilst we are still here we still have time uh, let's go to the first question the first question is uh, for major general oswald reddy the western k police ombudsman that question has been answered but uh, for the benefit of everyone and maybe for any quick follow-up that may come the question is um, I will be very interested in knowing how you separate traditional ombudsman functions from the role in overseeing police and military ombudsman functions. I think the general has answered that question and maybe just to share the answer in the interest of time, the answer was community engagement and media campaigns are held where mandate functions, role and responsibilities of the police ombudsman are brought to the attention of the general public. Despite these awareness campaigns, all types of complaints are still received by our office. A screening committee reviews each complaint and referrals are done for any complaint or matter not falling within the police ombudsman mandate. For an example, matters are referred to the public protector as a referral ICD, oh, sorry, I'm old fashioned now, the Independent Police Investigative Directorate, now IPID, uh, formerly ICD and the Human Rights Commission. That was uh, the answer. Now that answer has been answered, but I want to go to the next question where we need an answer. Um, again, this is for you. Uh, this, is, this one is for our panelists, I think uh, Mrs. Helen Nachtigail from um, the city of Ghent, uh, Ombudswoman, here is the question, ma'am. Question is, what are the values that Ombudspersons subscribe to and that set them apart from the ordinary public servants? That's the first question. And then uh, the second one, maybe let me pose them both. Ombudspersons are appointed by the state, so could that so could they be objective where the state is at fault? So these are the two questions. Uh, over to you, Mrs. Nettingale. Did you get those questions, ma'am? Can you, can you repeat? Say slowly. Please. Okay. All right, let's start with the first one. What are the values that almost persons subscribe to that set them apart from the ordinary public servant? Let's start there. Well, I think we are all public servants, so basically there shouldn't be any difference in the values we adhere to. Um, I think we, we should all have to aim to serve the public in the best way. Uh, and I think as ombuds person, you have the, the advantage that you, uh, you're not in the heat of the discussion. You always stand at the sideline and you're actually collecting both from the civilian who is uh, complaining and you're listening to the other side of the coin. And 
uh, you put two and two together and and i think um the this is the biggest advantage because you have a time lapse after it all happened so it's easier for us to look at it from um uh, uh, a perspective that we have a bit more uh, distance and can be a bit more rational that the emotion has gone from uh, maybe the, the the discussion or or but i think basically we we should all have the same standards of serving the the public the best we can and and listen to and and is this uh, acceptable as an answer can you recognize yes, absolutely yeah? absolutely absolutely um that that, that helps uh, but whilst you are still here there's one for you again uh, mrs nightingale the question is i'll again take it slowly it says ombudspersons are appointed by the state like in your case the city uh, council which is part of the state yeah. and the question is could you be objective where the state is at fault given that you are appointed by the state that's the essence of the question yes that is absolutely no problem to me it's it's i am being paid to be critical of what goes wrong and that's also why they appoint an ombudsman because uh, we are actually we have a helicopter view we can sometimes uh, uh, see that several city services do their job properly but if you put several pieces together that it goes wrong for the for the citizen and and that's our duty and actually i am absolutely not scared to uh, to be critical and and if they can't live with it then they should replace me and and hire someone else but i i want to look in the mirror and see that i'm an independent person and i'm not reporting to any of the mayor or the alderman so that's actually a guarantee for my my uh, independence that's how i see it thank you thank you very much ma'am i think what comes out is the integrity in doing this work and being objective and impartial thank you very much um let's continue in the same vein of q a the question now i think is for the military ombuds and i must uh, caution the military ombuds it appears that there is a um, few questions for you sir uh, so we will keep you busy here is the first one doesn't the plaintiff soldier risk suffering reprisals from his hierarchical super superiors when he or she lodges a complaint with you did you get that uh, major general uh, masondo the question is the complainant who's a soldier who's still serving isn't he or she taking a risk from the superiors of being uh, you know uh, victimized when um, he or she raises a complaint uh, with with you because he's still in the service and that's the essence of the question yeah, thank you very much uh, for the program for that question uh, in answer to the, the, this question, I think uh, first and foremost, I want to indicate that uh, I've got a monthly forum with the chief of uh, the National Defense Force, where we discuss uh, challenges around uh, the investigations uh, that we, we make, because sometimes uh, it takes time for them to respond uh, to uh, uh, requests uh, for information. But also, we also discuss issues of uh, implementation of our recommendations, where these are accepted by the minister. And of course, in monitoring that implementation, if uh, it comes to our attention uh, that, uh, so that there's some form of reprisal uh, uh, on the uh, uh, complainant, and of course, we'll uh, bring it up uh, to, to the chief of the National Defense Board so that it is uh, 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 attended to and resolved. But I must say, we have never had uh, such a, uh, such a, a, a situation because there is an understanding between uh, the South African National Defense Force 
uh, in my office of our uh, uh, different uh, uh, mandates and respect for that. Uh, and therefore, once we have uh, made the recommendation, there is an attempt uh, from the uh, uh, South African National Defense Force to ensure that uh, uh, those recommendations are implemented uh, without uh, victimizing uh, the complainants. I hope I've uh, answered the, that question. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir, you did. Um, let's go to the next one. Is the military ombudsman necessarily selected from the military or you could get uh, someone outside the military? Um, that's the question, sir. Well, uh, to respond uh, to this question, I would like uh, first to quote uh, from our act. It says uh, the uh, president must appoint a military ombudsman we must uh, possess adequate uh, knowledge of the constitution and must have uh, legal knowledge. And second, and most importantly, have knowledge or experience in the military and public administration that was gained over a period of 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think for, from that, it is clear that uh, the military on board can be either a, a retired uh, a, a, a general or, 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 or officer, uh, or party can also be a civilian. There, there's, uh, there's no, uh, there's nothing that uh, prevents a, a civilian uh, to be to be appointed as the military ombud. But I need uh, just to uh, state uh, the following. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the military is a very unique uh, uh, environment. And uh, at times uh, they, they can actually close in if uh, they feel they are working with somebody who does not understand that environment and all that. But when they are dealing with another military person who understands the environment and has grown to, through the ranks, uh, they, they tend to be open to uh, uh, discussions about uh, how they uh, uh, run the administration and ensure that uh, the uh, conditions of service of soldiers are actually uh, optimally uh, administered. So in short, I can say, uh, 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 in terms of the act, uh, uh, there's no requirement that uh, the military robot must be a retired military personnel. Thank but you. Thank in you, the wisdom you. of uh, the politicians, I think they felt uh, it would uh, make things work better if uh, the military almost is a retired uh, soldier. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Um, here is another question. In fact, it's just um, it's a comment uh, from um, from Togo Ombuds Ombudsman Office to you, uh, retired Major General Masondo. They say they just want to congratulate you on the presentation um particularly it speaks to where they are themselves as the office but the question is then uh, when the claimant is not satisfied with the outcome of your investigation i suppose you said that you can take legal action question is whether that action you mean it must be civil action or military action uh, i think there's a need for clarity there from the the need of full clarity uh, for, for, for that question, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, uh, our act says if a person is aggrieved by the decision of uh, the uh, ombud, he may apply to the High Court for a review against uh, the decision. So uh, 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 that can be understood that the civil uh, 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 legal action instead of uh, the military. Uh, 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 oh yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. I think that is uh, uh, that has come very clear. Uh, whilst we are looking for next questions, there is another question from Cordivo. They just wanted to congratulate the three speakers for their relevance on their presentations, especially the last two. In so far as it um, it is a project on which. Uh, we are working on, that is, we, the Cote d'Ivoire uh, Ombuds, namely the installation of military mediators. And uh, that's the question. And then um, this one, I think it's for all uh, speakers. 
maybe we're just gonna take one by one. Let's start with um, the ombuds for local uh, for, for local municipality of uh, Ghent. Uh, the question is, and this question will be for all three um, speakers. Let's start with uh, Mrs. Natinghela. Uh, what advice can you share for maximizing the impact of your recommendations when drafting them? What strategies do you have to escalate when there is ongoing resistance or non-action on implementation of your recommendations? Remember your recommendations, you said that they are not binding. So when you experience resistance, the question is, um, do you have strategies to escalate them to higher authority? And also in that question, the question is, what advice can you share in maximizing the impact of your investigations? The only thing what I can do and what I actually do, what I even did yesterday is before I issue the recommendation, I will discuss it with the uh, part of the city administration that is implicated, why we do it and what, what we have actually investigated and to what conclusions we came and we try to uh, let them understand what actually goes wrong and why we do we get and, and you, most of the time they actually realize yes you have actually through the thanks to the complaint and through the investigation you have shown that there there is actually a lack somewhere or a gap somewhere and uh, I, I encourage them to search themselves for a, for, a <coughs> for a problem sometimes or how they better collaborate with another service and in my view that's the only thing I can do to actually uh, create a kind of uh, yeah floor to to actually have them adapt to the recommendations or to to imply to applicate make an application of the recommendations but that's thank the only you. thing I think we can do yeah thank you I appreciate that and uh, Lieutenant General Masondo, same question. Any input from you or thoughts quickly, just in less than a minute? Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> what we as an office do, first uh, we, uh, we ensure that uh, our directorate did and uh, actually that's uh, the investigations, that is uh, the outcome of uh, those uh, investigations that uh, result in a preliminary report. Mm -hmm. And given the past experiences, uh, where, for instance, uh, we we'll finalize uh, the investigation and make recommendation without uh, the chief of the National Defense Force having insight into uh, 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 that report, we then introduce the step where we actually share uh, 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 the preliminary report uh, with both uh, the complainant and uh, the chief of the National Defense Force so that they can uh, uh, make uh, further uh, comments on that report. And of course, if uh, the, the comments they are making are, are valid, then we then uh, use those uh, to actually amend our, our report before finalizing it uh, and submitting it uh, to the minister. And I think uh, that, that has helped us a lot in terms of uh, our work. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Major General. Uh, lastly, but not the least, um, Major General Reddy, any thoughts, uh, inputs uh, from your side uh, on the same question in less than a minute again? We, uh, we will be tight thank with you. time. Uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with the SAPS, and we are currently drawing up one with the Metro Police, where we have cooperation and, you know, we agree on. But if we have a challenge, our line of uh, reporting goes to the Western Cape uh, Minister of Community Safety and Police Oversight. It then goes to the Western Cape uh, Portfolio Committee on Community Safety. If there's still a challenge, we then can report the matter to the National Commissioner of the Police because our jurisdiction is only the Western Cape. And finally, to the Minister of Police. Uh, you know, from the national government. Thank you very much, Major General. Uh, let's wrap up quickly in less than a minute. I just want to rush quickly before we 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 exhaust uh, the limited time we have. The question um, 
uh, I want to deal with is for the police ombuds quickly. Uh, and here is a question, um, Major General Reddy. Noting that you deal with security issues where lives are at stake, are there any measures in place or amendments to the Western Cape Community Safety Act to protect whistleblowers, having had that complainants have to state their ID numbers um, when they lodge the complaints with you? Major General Reddy, uh, did you get Yes, question? We, we have noted a few amendments that we need to bring to the Act. So there's a draft in, in place uh, in order that we protect the identity of the individuals. We do not share the identity of the complainant with anyone at any stage, but there are drafts in place that are currently being uh, looked at. Thank you, Major General Reddy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, really, um, there are a few questions. Um, that uh, I wanted uh, to raise with the panel. However, uh, we have exhausted the allocated time and with due respect to the participants, uh, Frankie and the team will respond to those questions when the panelists, uh, relevant uh, panel members respond to those questions. The response will be then uh, escalated uh, to, 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 to the question uh, raised by the person. So whoever raised the question will receive the answer. They'll be posted on the, um, on the website and uh, Frankie and the, the team will do so. But as we wrap up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say, um, uh, you know, I appreciate this uh, time. It's very important. We have shared our experiences. Uh, the three panel members have shared their experiences on them, how they do this work, the strategy, particularly the recommendations, because we speak through our reports and in our reports, we make recommendations. So when those recommendations are resisted, we've just gone through now this experiences shared by the panelists and the strategies to ensure that uh, we persuade uh, those who need to implement that. I think that's what came out for me and it's very important. But as we wrap up, I don't know if they, it's just in less than um, a minute for every panel member, uh, the three of you, um, uh, ladies and gents, is, are there any final thoughts you want to share uh, with the participants? Um, just a minute for everyone, and then uh, we can wrap up and uh, we can conclude uh, the session for today. Let's start with the ladies. Ladies first, uh, Miss Helena Nachengela, any uh, final thoughts uh, in less than a minute, please? Not really. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, meet all of you and to make this presentation. And um, please get in touch with me if you have any questions. You can find me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Lieutenant General, uh, Mr. Musondo, uh, any final thoughts uh, from your side? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think for us, we have learned one thing as teachers, teachers, that uh, we shouldn't have an uh, adversarial uh, relationship uh, with the uh, council so that we can be able to uh, uh, cooperate and uh, while uh, respecting our respective mandates. And I think uh, 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 that has led to some, from time to time, have differences in terms of how we view issues that uh, 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 we are able to work through those without compromising uh, on our mandate. And I think uh, the issue that, uh, as I indicated earlier on, that I've got uh, monthly meetings with the chief of uh, the National Defense Force, it helps a lot in terms of our work. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, yeah, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, Lieutenant General. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Lieutenant General uh, <clears throat> Masondo. In the interest of time, quickly to you, uh, Major General Red Reddy. Uh, any final thoughts? Less than a minute, sir. Yes. Thank you once again for the opportunity. You know, we come from a very dark past relating to policing in South Africa pre-1994. So this levels of accountability are essential in order to ensure transparency and accountability at every level, you know. The people of this country deserve professional service delivery. And therefore institutions such as ours are there to ensure that we provide a proper service to our communities whenever they want to complain. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Major General Reddy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, uh, fellow participants who have logged in from all corners where you are, I just want to take this moment and say 
thank you for your time and uh, thank you for the inputs, the questions, and a special thank you to our speakers and uh, who have shared their expertise with us, uh, exchanged strategies and empowered each other. Um, as I conclude from my side, I just wanna say, um, I was speaking to a friend and uh, we learned that, and he made this remark to me that um, democracy is waning in Africa and um, therefore depriving of our people of the promise of democracy. And uh, it dawned to me that in the space where I am and you are, you know, when there's a dispute, the courts resolve those disputes, but not everybody's got money or resources to go to courts. So these institutions, the Ombuds Institute institutions, uh, given our respective uh, jurisdictions where we operate, we are the catalyst between the members of the public or residents in our jurisdictions and, and the administrations that may be uh, depriving or uh, causing frustrations and depriving people of um, the promise of democracy and um, the rights uh, they, they have um, to access to, particularly you know, service uh, delivery or service uh, delivery related complaints um, in the space of local ombuds where I am situated. So to me, this, inst this institution of uh, you know, the ombuds is very important. And therefore today, again, this has not been a waste of time or just ticking the box. It was really sharing knowledge and then um, kudos to our host, the University of KwaZulu Natal. And uh, as we conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna say thank you all the participants who have logged in. And I want to hand over now to uh, Mrs. Uh, Marion uh, to really uh, close uh, the session and uh, over to you, ma'am. Mrs. Uh, Marion Adonis, thank you. Thank you to, every, to, to everybody for participating. We truly appreciate the attendance of the panelists and the participants. Thank you to the speakers for taking time from your busy schedule um, and to create awareness of sectoral ombudsman. Thank you for your wisdom and experience. Uh, it will be our pleasure to invite you in the future to spread awareness around the subject in the near future. Um, your presence and wise words helped enlighten the 120 participants in the best possible way. Um, just, I just want to note that recordings, presentations, and related documents will be available on the AOMA AYORC website within the next week. And we welcome you to revisit the content yourself and to share with your colleagues. AYORC looks forward to our next interaction soon, which will probably be in October. Wishing everybody all the best for your future endeavors. Thanks so much for your very valuable presentations uh, to the presenters. And thank you everybody once again. Thank you and goodbye from a very sunny, beautiful, goodbye. sunny weather. Please um, don't, don't rush off. Please activate your video so that we can take a digital photo. Thank you very much. Major General. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dan, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Have a lovely day. Thank you guys thank you so much. Bye, bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.